Cheers. Cheers. We're finally getting workers. In this video, we talk about what comes after the USCIS approval and why you'll be celebrating. I can't wait. We'll see you after the break. Cheers. to help you make better decisions and avoid costly mistakes on your immigration journey. And we are now deep into our H2B visa series for 2021-2022. We've gotten through five months of pain and the workers that you've been looking for are coming. You've been approved at both the Department of Labor and USCIS. Cheers again, my friend. Cheers. So in this video, we're going to discuss what you need to do now that you've received that approval to make sure, you know, you do things correctly, you don't get in trouble down the road, and everything goes smoothly. So it's 10 tips for after you get approved and have a drink because you deserve it. So the first thing you're gonna do after the workers are in trip is you have to make copies of your approval. Why are we doing that? So there are a few reasons why we would do this. Um, the first one is kind of looking down the road. You need to just have copies of that um, for compliance purposes, potential audits, things of that nature. There are requirements that you retain these documents. So go ahead and make a few copies just to be safe. But beyond that, you need to send a copy to your recruiter if you're using a recruiter. If not, you may want to supply a copy or at least that EAC number or you know something of that nature to potential applicants so they can easily reference that number when they apply at the consulate. Okay, so that's the first three things, right? Make copies, give it to your recruiter, make sure your beneficiaries or your applicants have them as well. Right. Okay, so step two, you've made copies for everybody that needs them. Now, you need to do what? You need to supply a translated job order, either to your recruiter, or if you're not working with a recruiter, supply that to every potential beneficiary so they can decide whether they want to apply based on the terms of their employment. So, if your workers are in Mexico, you want to translate it to? Spanish. If they're in France, you want to translate it to? French. If oh, okay, 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 we've, we've, gone, we've gone far enough. All right. Everybody. Don't, you, no need to test me. Okay. So, okay, no more need to test you. What's the next thing we do? What's number three? So this applies only if you're working with a recruiter. If you're working with a recruiter and you know what beneficiaries you want for the job. So, you know, maybe you've identified five, six, 10, 20, whatever that number may be. Maybe you've identified that number of beneficiaries and those individuals and you want those workers. If you have that information, go ahead and give it to your recruiter. If you don't have that information, that's fine. It's your recruiter's job to find you workers but you'll be doing them a big favor if you go ahead and supply the names and contact informations early so that they can contact those potential beneficiaries. Okay, so what we always advise is to put in petitions that don't name the beneficiaries that you want, even though you have certain beneficiaries in mind. So when you're giving the recruiter the names of the beneficiaries you want, it's usually with uh, an application which hasn't named the beneficiaries themselves. Correct, so we're, we're getting a little back to the I-129 and some of the details, um, but a pro tip is to always proceed with unnamed beneficiaries, but then you can still apply for specific beneficiaries who you want. It's, a, it's sort of complicated, it's hard to explain without really getting into the weeds, but just know, you know, we're here to help with that if that's a little confusing, which we know it is. So reach out to us if you want a little further explanation of that. All right, so we've translated documents, we've given them to the recruiter, we've given them to the beneficiary, we've made copies. The next thing we gotta do is pay visa costs somehow, right? And by we, I mean you, the employer. So you're gonna have to pay visa costs. There's several ways you can do that. Right, so this responsibility falls on the employer. Again, if you know the beneficiaries and you want to give them that cash in advance to file that visa application, you can. Um, you don't have to though, you can reimburse those costs. You're required to reimburse within a certain time limit 
if the worker is approved and does in fact come to the country. Um, but it's really just up to you. There's a little bit of flexibility. If you're working with a recruiter, they may do things differently. They may require you to pay the visa costs for all of your workers who are interviewing up front. And then they should, make sure you're working with a, a good recruiter, they should hold that money in escrow until it's time to pay it out. So again, there are different ways to go about this, but at the end of the day, just know you are gonna be on the book for those visa costs. Okay, so we pay the visa costs, we've translated everything, we've notified everybody. Now the workers are coming, right? They are approved, they're coming to your site. What do we have to think about? Yeah, inbound, outbound travel. Um, this is gonna to touch on inbound. So you are responsible for that inbound travel. You, again, there's flexibility. You don't have to pay for a first class ticket. You don't have to go pick these workers up. You don't have to pay their costs in advance know that you will be covering these travel costs but again there's flexibility a lot of employers i work with will you know take a passenger van they will go pick up a group of workers and transport them this works really well if you're in texas maybe louisiana doesn't work so well in connecticut yeah probably gonna have to get them on a plane and yeah that's gonna cost a little more but not not that much more and in the end if you get them faster to your work site, you're gonna make money faster. Pro tip, book that flight. Don't leave it up to them to book the flight and then ask for reimbursement because you will have to reimburse. If they fly first class, you might be on the hook for that. Hopefully, they won't fly first class. That might be a red flag, but at this point, it's kind of too late. All right, so you've paid for the visa, you've told the recruiter everything they need to know. Now we need to follow through. What does that mean? So your workers are here, so follow through. Take a look at that job order that you submitted, take a look at the job description, and make sure you're doing exactly what it says. You're paying the rate that you promised you would pay. If you stated 10 counties that these workers would work in, don't send them to county 11. But what if like 11 is really important for my business? Send your permanent workers. These workers are limited to the geographic areas that you stated. If County 11 happens to fall into the same MSA, that's fine. But if it's outside of that MSA, that geographic region that you have a prevailing wage for, do not send them there or else you may be dooming yourself for the food future. For the future. You're dooming yourself to the food truck. Yeah. So. Follow through with that job order. Make sure you are doing everything you promised you would do. You know, if even if you don't pay your local workers bi-weekly, you promised your H2Bs you would pay them at least bi-weekly. So you have to do it. Follow through. The reason you want to do this is because the risk of audits, informally from what we can tell, has gone up. You know, we've talked about in a previous video how two clients that Trent has are, are going through an audit. And the easiest way to run a file of an audit is to not do what you said you were gonna do. And the prize that you get is what? <laughs> so the risk is higher if you're not doing what you said you were gonna do. Your beneficiaries are more likely to report you if they're disgruntled. So if you were reported by a beneficiary of not following through. And you can, you know, found guilty of that. You might hit fine. It might be a, a small penalty fee. And you'll also get your name in a public registrar of offenders of the program. Which might result in a, a bar for some period of time. So if you like the h 2 b program, you found it beneficial, you really don't want to you know, underpay your workers, not pay them as regularly as you promised, or to sort of change their job description when they get here. Okay, all right. So we've gone over that very sternly. What's the next thing we wanna do? We wanna get these workers what? What's really important for them to live for anybody living in the United States? Get them a social security card. So you've brought them in, you've, you know, you've reimbursed them. Get them a social security card. It's a temporary card um, that is for employment purposes. Uh, most employers will do this within the first two weeks to make payroll simple. Okay, super easy. We don't need to talk about it anymore. You just gotta do that. It's gonna help everybody. All right, so we've done that. We've done everything right. The workers are here. We've paid for the visa. You know, we've reimbursed for travel. We've reimbursed for dailies. We are following through, doing everything we can. Everybody has a social security card. 
things are happy, but dang it, one of the workers abandons you. Right. So this, why are we concerned about this? This happens. It happens. It, it does not happen that commonly, but, but it does happen. I mean, for the most part, workers will be, you know, pretty happy. They'll be receiving the wage that they agreed to and workers stick around for the duration of their work period. But sometimes workers may, you know, join another company that's offering 50 cents a dollar higher. They may want to go back home because they're homesick. This happens, doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. And if that happens to you, if your workers join another company, if they go home unexpectedly, if they come home unexpectedly, even if you're okay with it, if you pay for their bus ticket and you know that they crossed the border, you still have to report them. Here's a very useful link. It has all the information you're gonna need. It's right up here. You can actually see the webpage. We'll put the link in the description. And you need to do that because it removes the responsibility and the liability from you as an employer. You're not being mean, you're just doing what you need to do, okay? All right, so we've workers abandoned, we notified authorities of the termination, that was part nine. Part 10, encouraging workers to leave on time. I mean, this is a nine slash 10 month program, right? The nine month rule was never implemented, it's actually 10 month for seasonal peak load intermittent workers. It's one year for one-time workers, but people have to have to leave on time. What does that mean, Trent? Yeah, so you know there are scenarios where workers don't have to leave. Maybe they switch employment to another certified employer who has positions available. Again, there are examples like that, but in general, encourage your workers to leave when their work with you is done. So if your last date of need is September 1st, September 1st, you need to encourage them to be prepared to leave between September 1st and September 11th because they are given a 10 day window following the end of their work permit to return to their home country. Now, again, you may have some workers who don't do this. They may join another company. They may do, you know, whatever else they want to do. But your job as an employer is to encourage them to abide by the rules and the guidelines. Now, once that work period is over, your responsibility is over. You do not have to chauffeur them across the border or back to their home country, but we recommend that you encourage and there will be some return transportation costs and you know, however they came to the country may be the easiest way to return them to their, to their home country. So, and you wanna do this, uh, mainly, I, I think from a business perspective, because you'd love to have those workers back as you can renew right. those H2Bs. So, we started this episode about cheersing and let's let's finish it again by cheersing because you've accomplished something. You are now able to bring in your workers. You now know what steps you have to take once they are here and you're going to have a successful season. You're now able to meet your contractual demands, increase revenue, etc. It's gonna be a good nine, 10 months, whatever you apply for. So cheers. Congratulations. Thanks for getting through the series. We're gonna put up some other videos that may be random that aren't gonna be part of the series. We wanna talk about the lottery, what that means, how it works. We wanna talk about some other stuff, but you've gotten through the brunt of it. You're ready for the 2021 2022 season. If you like this, subscribe, hit the notification, share it, give us a comment. If you want a text version because you have trouble following along with us as we potentially ramble, check out h2blawyer.com. This entire series is on that website. That's yeah, freaking awesome. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.